Everybody having a good time out here at PRG? Yeah. Nice. Did you guys get shaken out of your money? Focus more on the mic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, me too. You, you got to lean in. Yeah. Or bring the mic in. Yeah, there we go. All right. How's that? Better? Yep. Yeah. yeah, my pocket doesn't like me anymore. You have to show some light when I get back. All right. <clears throat> So we're just going to preemptively talk about this thing because it's not technically part of the panel and I think we got 10 minutes extra, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so everybody familiar with the virtual boy? Everybody here? Yeah. I guess it's again the right audience for that. So uh, Candice, if you'll come here for one second. Um, this is Candice. I know. Um, so Candace made this. Why don't you tell them a little bit about it, if you don't mind? So six, to, six to seven years ago, I was on this Virtual Boy forum, and jokingly, we were all talking about how Nintendo never made girl versions of their handhelds or anything that was like the Game Boy, the Game Girl, that never existed. So I had a spare parts console at home and a rattle can of paint, and more time than I want to admit, and I painted it and made it the virtual girl. It started out as a joke, and now I'm doing things like this. <laughs> it's pretty cool. And what, what's, what's with all the chicken scratch on there? What's going on? Well, you know, there was this jerk that I met in New Jersey at a convention about six years ago, and he just took my Sharpie and destroyed it. Sounds about right. It sounds about right. Do you remember who this person was? Might have been some jerk from Chicago. I think right, Adam right. That's possible. That's possible. I think that's right. That's yeah, it might be. It. Yeah. I, <laughs> to be fair, you asked me to I sign did. it. I like did. I didn't just. No, I didn't I, just I, I, hijack your work. <laughs> but so yeah, I I signed this little scribble thing right there. My signature is terrible. She could scribble. Um, and so I, back then, I just whatever. I just signed it. But over the years, I've gotten used to whenever I sign something, that if somebody's like, oh, can you sign this thing? That's so cool. I, I do this little chicken scratch, and I'm like, oh. Like you just see this look of failure on their face. Like so, so later, when I would see her eventually, uh, I wrote out my name in manuscript, which is now the way I have to do it. But then eventually we started upgrading it, adding extra words, pointing arrows. But she's also got talented people on this, too. She's got uh, Shane Lewis, Rerez. Uh, yesterday, Stop, uh, Derek, Stop, Stop Skeletons from Biting signed it for the first time. We got Gilly the Kid. Uh, Mel Jesus Rocks is on there. Uh, Kinsey. Uh, Kelsey Lewin, who's, who's this? G to the next level, we just got a signature. Oh, this today. just happened? Yep, signature. Wow, you. round of applause for that one, we got more. Um, we got John Riggs, yeah, a lot of the regulars, AVGN, Happy Console Gamer, Pat Contract. Anyway, so you've had this thing just signed by a ton of YouTubers and talented people, plus me. Yes. <laughs> Which is nice, I appreciate being included. Um, <laughs> But there you go, the one of one, the virtual girl. You know what's funny, actually, so in uh, Brazil, Sega actually did release something called the Game Girl. Yep. That is a licensed thing, it is a Master System portable. So once again, Sega does what Nintendo don't do. I'll give credit, I'll give credit. Sega shirt, I'm on a certain team. <laughs> oh, oh, and what? oh, you, oh. I like Nintendo, but we have to pretend, you know. I'm gonna get kicked off now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, for all for our purposes, you're the Atari guy. Yeah, today. That is fair. All right. So um, we still have officially four minutes. What's up? How you guys doing? Anybody find anything really cool, rare, oddball thing out there? What you got? Picked up a PC Engine shuttle. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Oh, I think I, I know which table you're talking that. about. Yeah. Yeah. The guy had like two 64 DDs. I know. Yeah, yeah. that guy. Yeah. That guy had some weird stuff. Yeah. I picked yeah. up something from that same guy too. I got yeah, yeah. Really it's funny because like he had he had it there like on the shelf and I'm or on the table or whatever. And I'm just like, well, look at that. It's so cool. And it's like not even that expensive. And he just like pulls a pre shrink wrapped like different PC engine shuttle from like under the table what? and just gives that to me. And it's wow. Like, why would you have two of these? <laughs> so that guy has such crazy stuff, and like every time I've ever seen him here, it's it's like he just reloads with rare stuff that's impossible to find. I and he's funny. Yeah, I did too. I'm not gonna say what I bought that the, uh, that video, and it's embarrassing. But I, <laughs> um, it's a laser active game. Yeah. What's wrong with that? Uh, uh, it, it given the adult nature of the game. Oh, no. <laughs> 
Chicago. So long, what are you going to be doing when you get back to Chicago? Uh, is it first the long, cameraman? cold winter? <laughs> I, I, I leave Chicago in the winter, dude. Like it's it's not it's not tolerable there. Um, but yeah. Well, congrats. Anybody else get like anything on that level? Oh, oh, that was your phone. Oh, yeah. a yellow Xbox controller. It's not a normal Xbox controller. It's an Xbox One. Oh, yeah, yeah. Original controller, but it looks like a 360. I was just gonna say that it looks. Wow. Yeah. Where where was this? That's a top of the line games. But no, I did. Is it's this official? Controller. Yeah, we're gonna figure out what it is. Wow. Somebody buy it? No. Yeah, she's how much to charge her? Well, that's not helpful. It's a man cast controller. No, that ain't no man cast controller, man. That's that that. Im All right, so for those obviously guys, you can't see the photo. It's an original Xbox S controller, uh, but in yellow plastic. Yeah, that's okay. So that's interesting because the original Xbox had multiple colors for the console. And I th I'm assuming a bunch of you guys saw that like orange one that surfaced a few years back. I know Jason Metal Jesus did a video on it. As far as I know, there's never been a you know, five seconds. Five seconds. All right. All right. Let me anyway, off. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Round of applause for Candace. So uh, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming out to this panel. Uh, my name is uh, Adam Korlick. I'm a YouTuber. I've been doing retro video game content for way too long. I think like 13, 14 years. Um, I'm I'm an OG on YouTube. I'm right there with like Game Straight One. It's like he and I talk about this. Like we're the two oldest people on that platform. Um, but anyway, so this is. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself. What's up, man? I'm Jesse Perez. I'm not a YouTuber, but I do drive a lot. <laughs> I drive a lot. Okay, by driving a lot, we've been up here four times in car. Yeah, so uh, a lot of the time, this dude, this is a good guy, by the way. Like anytime I show up in like Los Angeles or San Francisco, anywhere in California, anywhere in the West Coast, this dude just shows up in a car and just picks me up, and we go wherever we have to go, which is included here. So thank him because that's the only way you're gonna be able to see all these weird prototypes and stuff we're about to talk about. Um, so what we have here is uh, <laughs> there you go. You're, you're the best. Thank you. Um, so basically the way I had kind of set this up, I thought we would talk about uh, a few different prototype consoles, their stories. Uh, we have two of them in front of us, and we can also, if need be, we can do some Q&A, or actually to be honest, I kind of prefer Q&A anyway. Mm -hmm. But um, So the first thing I wanted to talk about, and I'm sorry we don't have a photo of it, but we live in the era where you all have phones. Um, so you can look up the Nintendo PlayStation prototype. Are you guys familiar with that? Yeah. Right. So it was. It used to actually make the rounds out here. The last convention it was ever at was actually PRGE 20, 2019. Yeah. Um, so I thought I would talk a little bit about it because, uh, in addition to its history, just like I had kind of a personal situation with it because I was actually the last person to ever play it. Um, so the, the story with that, if you're unfamiliar with the basics, is that uh, Nintendo and Sony once were getting together to make a console. It's a very truncated version of history, but eventually that deal fell apart for, I would speculate, various reasons. Actually, Ben Hack, who had access to it more than anybody, thinks that the reason it failed is because the CD slot was comically pathetic. Like, if you ever looked at a Sega CD for a Genesis, the benefits were you had video capabilities, you had better audio, under, under the hood it could do new things like rotating and scaling. So the idea behind the Nintendo, uh, Super Nintendo CD or Nintendo PlayStation was that it would theoretically be able to enhance the Super Nintendo. But per Ben Heck, he was like, it's the Super Nintendo with load times. It has no benefit. Um, maybe hypothetically some music could have worked on it, but that's about it. So um, eventually that whole thing, it, the project died and like they made supposedly 200 prototypes, 199 of them destroyed. One ended up on the desk of Olaf Olafsson, who was the first president of PlayStation as we think of it now. Years later, in like 2009, uh, his company was going out of business. He was no longer with PlayStation. And as part of an estate sale, basically like Storage Wars style, uh, uh, the late Terry Diebold uh, ended up winning it completely unintentionally. Uh, it had, he actually was a contractor who was just like doing stuff where he's packing things up. And when he was packing things up, he told me this. He was just like, Yeah, they had a bunch of really nice plates. I wanted these plates and cups. That's all I cared about. So I put them all in this box, knowing it would be that box. And that's what I bid on. 
I won that for $75. No. And then, but see, that's the only thing he was bidding on. All the other boxes, unsold. And so since he actually bought one, they're like, just take all these other boxes with you. Guess what was in one of them? The Nintendo PlayStation prototype. Now, Terry was not a gamer in any way, shape, or form. So he first saw it, he was like, eh, some box thing. And he put it away, didn't think at all about it. Years later, uh, apparently what happened was uh, myself and a few other YouTubers had been making about videos on this thing, just kind of, you know, something to talk about, right? And his son, Dan, had seen one of these videos, uh, and I don't, I don't know if it was mine or one of the others, but his, his son had seen that and said, oh no, I think my dad has that. And now the entire internet like tried to crucify him over it for lying. It's like, You're, this isn't real, it's not possible, you're a liar. So he goes, he calls up his dad, and Ter Terry was like, well, I think it's still up in the attic. I don't know, I haven't thought about it in years. Because he, Terry told me he had tried to find out some information on it, but he's like, the patent number was like totally, you know, nothing you could find uh, because he kept looking up American patent numbers. It wasn't until then that he thought to look up the Japanese patent number. And all of a sudden, it all came rolling. Uh, so he eventually, they got together with his son, they made this YouTube video, which you can still see to this day, which has millions of views because it was the discovery of this thing. Uh, then he started taking it to conventions. Uh, then he took it to Ben Heck, they ended up completely restoring it. And that's how you would eventually see it at all these conventions. Um, and we got to play it a lot of the time. It, it was a bizarre piece of tech. I mean, yeah. did you ever, did, how much time did you actually spend playing with it? Um, anytime, anytime I was with you guys. So, down plus at the hotel. Really. Yeah, well, we'll get to that. But <laughs> So, um, he, he eventually uh, let, he got the CD drive working last. That was the last thing he ever got functional. And we discovered some oddities about it. Like, the disk drive, there were no games ever really specifically written for it. Supposedly there's a version of Secret of Mana that runs on it, but it's never surfaced. They ended up dumping the BIOS, put it online, said, develop something, somebody do that. One guy did, I think his name is Mr. Wizard, yeah. if I recall correctly, and he developed a game called Super Boss Guide. Now the premise of this game is that uh, Sony has lost their prototype, and uh, <laughs> and now and the president of Sony is very upset. So he has to he has to run around and beat up all of his employees to find out who let it out. That's the and you can actually play this. It was dumb it, because again the SNES CD was essentially just the Super Nintendo with load times. The ROM has been dumped. You can even get repro cards of this game if you're curious. It's out there. You can play it. But it was the only game ever technically made for that system. Um, if you were to run other things on the disk drive, it was capable of playing music CDs, but we discovered, well I should say, like myself and one other guy, we were testing a bunch of random things, and we noticed that if you took, if you were playing a Super Nintendo game, and then put a disk drive, a disk in it, like a music CD, whatever, it would completely cut off the audio of the game while the game continued to play, and it would completely replace it with the music of whatever the CD was. Kind of like the way the original Xbox could do that, except it didn't have the intelligence to understand the sound effects. It was just kind of a flat thing. So it's, if you ask me, in my opinion, I think Sony probably was thinking we could do basically early DLC in the form of like upgrading the music of pre-existing Super Nintendo games with a little additional code so that the sound effects stayed in place, but purely speculation. Um, now, years later, uh, Terry would ultimately decide he was going to sell it, and that's what happened here. Uh, and he told me that in advance, and so I was like, hey man, like, it would be really nice to be able to do like a formal review of this thing, sit down and really look at it. So that's what he refers to with the hotel room. The last PRGE, he invited us up to his room, we bought him some beers, which I know sounds like it's going in a weird direction. <laughs> um, but no, we, we just, we went into his hotel room and we just sat there and filmed a whole bunch of stuff. And then I did an interview with him, because he was telling me like, most people never did interviews with him. They just kind of wanted to see what it was, and he just told the whole story story. Uh, he then, that day, turned the, uh, we, you know, we were disconnecting the console, and I was able to play it. I filmed this moment in part of that video, knowing this is the last time it was ever going to be played. Uh, and then that evening, I found out later that Heritage Auctions took it with them to a vault in uh, Dallas, and ultimately it was sold a few months later for $334,000. Yeah. Um, which was unfortunately much less than it was expected to go for. It was expected to go for like two million. 
Um, now, if you ask me, a one, two million dollars is obviously a lot of money, but it's also like, who really wants to spend that kind of money on something like that? Um, the ultimate answer to that question, though, was Greg McLemore. He's the guy who made Pets.com. He's the guy who now owns the Nintendo PlayStation prototype. Uh, and I was told that Greg, awesome guy as he is, he bought it for the same reason you buy a painting. You know, it's just, it's something expensive and rich and he goes in your house. And it's currently sitting in a vault in Los Angeles. Though, from what I understand, if you get to know him, he's more than willing to show it to you. He just has no interest in doing like retro game cons. And if you're like a multi-bajillionaire, I guess I can't blame you for that. Um, but yeah, so it's safe, but it may never see the light of day again. But it, it is out there. Um, anything else you want to say on the Nintendo PlayStation prototype? No, not really. I mean, it's pretty much everything there. I was just the person behind the camera filming you guys. Yeah, I, I, you know, the thing with Terry, though, is that, uh, for those who don't know, right after he sold it, like, he, we don't know entirely what happened to him, because he vanished for, like, five months, and then all of a sudden, he was found dead. Um, oh, yeah, I know it sounds bad, but we, uh, if, uh, Terry always told me for years that he had no intention of ever selling it. He's like, this thing, you know, he just, it was never part of the plan. He's like, I don't care how, you know, much money problems I have, because he, I don't mean to speak ill of him, he was a great guy, but he had massive debt problems, which he would constantly tell you to your face. Um, and he, I think, didn't want to sell it because it was kind of like Rose and Titanic. You know, it's like you're the poorest person, but you also have the richest thing ever, and you didn't know what to do with it, uh, with the, the heart of the ocean or whatever. And I think that ultimately he sold it because I think he knew he was going to die. And I think we think he had cancer. And... Uh, yeah, so I, I like to believe, because he was my friend, that uh, ultimately he just kind of spent the last like five months of his life, you know, drinking and having a great time and not allowing his ex-wife to have any money. I think that I think that was part of his goal. Um, so R.I.P. Terry, and thanks to him, you know, we all got to experience that and see that rumor come to reality. Um, so moving forward, let's let you talk a bit about the Jaguar here, ish. Yeah. So. This right here is the dental unit that people have talked about on the internet. There's pictures about it, um, but no one actually saw it um, until um, one day I decided to check eBay to see if there were any shells available for my um, ja uh, Jaguar, because I got a Jaguar collection. I got a couple of them. Um, and I thought it would be cool, like other people, to put a shell on it. So I found it on eBay, 25 bucks for a shell. I bought it and it showed up. And I noticed that on the package, the address was from the Bay Area, from Imogen Systems. And I'm like... To be clear, he lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah. So, so I'm looking at the, the address and the, the, the name, and I'm like, man, this is, is this the place? So I did a search. I found Imogen Systems. They're actually in the peninsula uh, by San Mateo, California. Um, and I called the guy, and I said, hey, uh, I can't uh, help to notice that you're very close. Um, can I come by the office and maybe pick up some, some other things? Because they, they also had like uh, the wall mounts to put these. And so uh, he said, yeah, you can come by anytime. At the time I was doing delivery or um, uh, uh, transport for people to the airport from where I live to SFO. So I dropped the people off. I went over to the office. Uh, I got to meet uh, Steve, the owner. And we were talking about this. And uh, he went to the back, brought out a box full of shells and uh, all the other stuff that goes to it. So the idea was that the, um, this camera system was to allow you to be able to just buy one camera for the dental office and be able to take it to the different rooms and just dock it. So that way you, they didn't have to buy three or four cameras to have one in each room. You could just do the one. So I bought the, um, the, the docks and a couple more shells and as I'm doing this, he was chatting with me and asking what I do. I do electronics repair and uh, uh, a lot of uh, Nintendo modifications. And uh, so he said, hey, I, I'm looking for a guy like you. And so he hired me. So 
I actually work for these guys. <laughs> <laughs> it all comes full circle. So, so before my first day, I get a hold of this guy and I tell him, hey dude, <laughs> you're not gonna believe this, but one, it's real, and two, I'm working for the guy. You need to come over here and uh, check it out. And he happened to be going to San Francisco for, what was it? Yeah, I was at a Ubisoft. Yeah, right? Ubisoft. So I pick him up, I bring him to the office, and, uh, and, uh... That was the weirdest first meeting. Yeah. Because he was just like, yeah, I know we don't know each other, but I'm gonna take you out to some random place to talk about Atari Jaguar right. and equipment. And, uh, and I was like, and I was like, all right. <laughs> I get outside, his car is just filled to the brim with like random N64 stuff. <laughs> and we just haul across the bay. Yeah, so then we, uh, we got to the office, I introduced him to Steve. Um, Steve's a pretty cool dude. And uh, uh, we spent the whole day with him. And uh, Adam's like, hey, I, don't, I hope you don't mind, but can I do an interview with you? And he was like, yeah, sure. So, man, he brought out everything, like receipts from Atari, um, you know, all kinds of weird stuff. Yeah, it was it was a fun experience talking to him, but I should probably clarify in case anybody's like, what? <laughs> like, what are, what are we talking about right now? Um, the history of this thing basically is that Atari, like when they were going out of business, um, they were liquidating everything they possessed, all their assets, they were done. Uh, and one of the things they sold was the molds for the Jaguar. Uh, and ultimately Steve, who he's referring to, bought those molds thinking, I don't know anything about video games, I don't care about that. That looks just like a perfect camera rig for my, my dental equipment. Um, so the whole, that rumor is completely real. The whole hot rod thing, that's what this thing's called. It's called the hot rod. Hot rod. Um, and uh, so what happened with that is that after he made them, um, and this one even says on the back, demo unit, not for sale, hot rod, dental manager. Um, he only made seven because it uses SCSI technology. I don't know how many people are old enough to remember that. That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the thing that predates USB. So uh, once these were done, and it actually has a timestamp, I think it actually says this was the revision from 2000, and, yeah, July 25th, 2004. Okay, so that's like, after, I mean, we're, that's like a year away from the Xbox 360 and you're releasing something with SCSI on it. <laughs> so it was not really surprising that nobody wanted to buy that. They were like, USB is the new industry standard, this doesn't have enough of a point, blah, blah, blah. So only seven of these got made. But if you've ever looked online and you were like, well, I see white shells all the time. Steve Mass produced thousands of those. <laughs> yeah. He just never did the guts part. Um, except for literally the one you, this one, plus like one other, are the only two that were ever sold. And like the rest were just kind of prototypes in Steve's like, st like you know, his uh, office. So he's like got all of them there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's, when we did the interview with him, he was literally just going through the original Atari like receipt work order. And he was even surprised like, I thought for years that the molds had been sold for like thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Cause it just seems like the kind of thing that would be expensive. He's like, no, it was fourteen hundred dollars for everything. Uh, it wasn't much. It was. I mean, we're not talking just. It was the rights to everything, including he also bought the cartridge molds. Um, and we were like, "What did you need the cartridges for?" He was like, "Ram." You know, like he could have upgrades and stuff. He bought the CD drive rights too. It's like, what would that have done? He's like, I don't know, updates? I don't know. <laughs> like, the, the, the one thing he didn't buy was the controllers. He said, Trevor, like, what would I do with controllers? I'm like, I don't know, man. Like, but it's funny, if you look at it, it still has the holes in here for controllers. Yeah. So if, to cover that up, he just designed this extra piece that's just a handle. But you can click on it. There's even a tooth button on it. You can click the tooth button. <laughs> you hear that? So yeah, this is, that whole story is completely true. It is real and there it is in our reality right now. And if it wasn't, yeah. Go and dentistry. If, and if it wasn't for that, like, Go dentistry. Brief, go yeah, dentistry. Go. <laughs> yes. And if it wasn't for that brief moment where the guy at the, so the molds are actually held at the um, facilities where they press things. You don't actually have them at your office. And so he was actually just going to talk to the people about updating his older design, which surprisingly looked like this. It had like the bump on here, but it was just a lot bigger. And so 
when he went to go talk to them about some updates to the design of his older one, then they were like, hey, we got this new thing that's very similar to your old thing. You want to look at it. And Steve looked at it, and here, he is. here it is. Yeah, this is how it happened. And you know, the funny thing is, and uh, he has expressed some regret over this, is he was done with it. He had no further interest in it. Anybody remember the Coleco Chameleon? <laughs> um, so Steve's unfortunate little contribution to that, unintentional as it was, was that uh, the guy Mike who did that reached out to him and was like, can I buy the molds? And Steve's like, yeah, I don't know, whatever. I think he bought them for like 10 grand or something. I don't know. I, I don't remember the number offhand, but I remember Steve being like, I made money on a thing I never got to release. That was kind of <laughs> cool. But then he was like, after he heard about what happened, he's like, oh, maybe I can buy that back. But that was the last time we ever heard about it. But yeah, so there it is. Well, since then, Atari Age now has the molds. Oh, they so, do? I didn't know that. Yes. That's cool. So Atari Age, I don't think they've really done anything with the mold yet, but I'm happy that they have it and not the other day. Yeah. yeah. But it is cool all the same that that's the weird little half cousin like in between that link there. <laughs> Um, so the last thing that we have here uh, that we can talk about before we do any questions is this. This is the Sega Pluto prototype. Oh, wow. um, yeah, all right. So where do we even start with this thing? Uh, first of all, what is the Sega Pluto? Uh, the Sega Pluto is ultimately a Sega Saturn, but kind of like the Pro version. Think like PS4 Pro as opposed to a PS4. Um, from a spec perspective, it's mostly the same. It has some additional RAM in it. Uh, it has a built-in modem right here, which we just removed so you guys can see it. And it has a built-in hard drive. Yes, a hard drive. Like an actual, that's, we have a duplicate one, but it's like an IDE 512 megabyte hard drive. Of an old school laptop. Yeah, and um, the thing is, this is the first console in history with a hard drive. Like literally the one I'm in, in possession of here. Uh, and this is 1996. 512 megabyte hard drive. That's ridiculously unprecedented. Um, the, the basic story with what happened here is that Sega went through a weird phase where they were like obsessed with planets. Uh, so if you ever heard of the, you know, the Sega Mercury is the game gear. The Sega Venus is actually the uh, Nomad. Uh, in fact, Sega themselves found an earlier version of the Nomad. They openly call the Sega Venus. You can Google this right now. There was a portable version of the Mega Drive, specifically called the Venus. Uh, Sega Earth is the Sega CD, which is why when you turn it on, there's that like, music and the Earth is in the background there. Uh, the uh, Mars is the 32X. Yep. If you actually if you open up a 32X, it says Mars on the board. It doesn't say 32X anywhere on it. Uh, and the Jupiter was a basically a, an alternative 32-bit console they were working on, a cartridge-based one that has never seen the light of day. Uh, the Saturn, obviously, everybody, we all know what that one was. Um, the uh, Neptune is a 32X uh, Genesis combo, only one of which exists, and it's down in the uh, National Video Game Museum in Frisco, Texas. Um, in fact, spoilers, but we did a prototype family reunion with this thing and that thing, just because, yeah, it was pretty cool. I did a video on it, it was pretty sweet. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so, and uh, Sega Uranus was skipped for pretty obvious reasons. Uh, so, so then, yeah, then there was Sega Pluto, which is ironically not even a planet anymore. Um, so the thing with this, though, is that from our understanding, uh, <laughs> Basically, say I, I ended up once we had this thing in our possession. I, I talked to some people at Sega because I had been working with them for years prior for re-releases of Shenmue and other stuff. And I was like, "What? What is the deal with this? Like, what's the story?" And they were like, "Most of us didn't have anything to do with that or work there, but like we looked in archives and basically we made seven of them. Uh, five of which were never functional; they were just like cosmetic white mock-ups." Um, four of those, the white ones, were destroyed. One of them now exists in the National Video Game Museum in Frisco, Texas again. Uh, and the two functional units, one was sent to Japan for Sega Japan's final authorization of the project, and one was mysteriously vanished out of our office in California. Take a guess where that ended up. Um, so the project was ultimately canceled, and this thing somehow found its way to a flea market in Ceres, California in 1999. Ten minutes south where I live. Yep. And our buddy Roger, when he was a kid, saw this amongst a pile of CD players 
And he now recognizes that guy had to be a former Sega employee because he's like, that guy always had weird stuff. He had Saturn development kits and Dreamcast development kits and all sorts of stuff. But, he, you know, this is what he picked out because, again, he was a child. He saw this, saw the Saturn logo on the door and thought, well, this is pre-Google. So he's like, Japanese Saturn, that's probably what that is. So he just, he was like, how much, five bucks? I'll give you three. Yeah, sure, whatever. So he bought this for three dollars. Um, and again, he thought it was Japanese, so when he took it home, tried to put a Japanese game in it, didn't do anything, because it's American region lock. He didn't know that, and he never thought to try it. So uh, he just put it in a shoebox, and more or less forgot about it for two decades. So years later, the Japanese one of these surfaced in 2013 because the owner of it was a former Sega employee who died. So the person who was in charge of his estate was like, I don't know what this is, I cannot source this, any information on this. So it went up on the internet, and that's when the internet exploded over the idea of the Sega Pluto. And Roger, being the humble little man that he is, was like, I have one of those. And the internet once again crucified him, which seems to be a very similar trend. Um, whenever you find something amazing like this, for some reason everyone hates you. Um, and so he puts out the Pluto online, and everybody's just like, no, that's not real, that's not real. Anyway, so he was like, and Roger's a very nice guy, and has really no interest in an internet presence, so he's like, hmm, my life was kind of alright until I started telling everybody I had this thing, and now everybody tells me to kill myself and blah 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 for owning something, because people are insane. So he's like, you know what, this goes back in my shoebox, I don't need this. Um, so years later, I was introduced to him very casually. Uh, our mutual friend Rudy was like, hey Adam, you know what the Sega Pluto is? I'm like, yeah, of course I do, you know, I've heard about that. Because of course I wouldn't know something like that, because that's, that's my zone, man. He's like, yeah, the guy who owns it's like 10 minutes from here, you want to meet him? I was like, oh! You know, like, and he was like, yeah, I'll give him a call. 10 minutes later, Roger shows up with it, and I'm like, and he's like, why do you care? <laughs> I'm like, it's the Sega Pluto! <laughs> it was super exciting to me. Um, now at the time when he showed it to me, the disk drive was perpetually like this. Now the reason for that is this little white mechanism here did, simply did not exist. Sega never built it. And so I was just like stunned looking at it. I'm like, this is so insane. Do you understand what you have? He's like, man, it's a Sega or something. I was like, okay, Roger, Jesus. Okay, so um, upon our initial testing, I was like, okay, there's something wrong with the controller core, but if you lift it, you know, it'll start to work. That's a common issue with Saturns. If you hold the disk lid down, it'll attempt to spin a disk, cool, whatever. And he's like, yeah, but it doesn't work, it doesn't play discs. I'm like, well, you know, did you put an American game in it? He's like, no. And I was like, well, let's, we put in virtual hide light. Remember that? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, the here's worst. the thing, here's the thing. <laughs> that wasn't because we wanted to, it was just because it was there. Like, <laughs> we had access to it. And so it booted up. And so, therefore, the Virtual Hide Light was the first game played on this thing in like 30 years. Um, but we, it did function. So he was kind of stunned because he's like, oh, wow, okay. And I was like, dude, we need to do something with this. This thing can't just be sitting in your shoebox. You know, like, we need to do something. Show people. Let people see it. And he was like, all right, whatever you think. So we took this to Ben Heck, who once again is connected to all these things like the Nintendo PlayStation. Now, when I, we did a video with him. You guys might have seen it on Ben's channel. Uh, there was some updates done to it, but he said really not much was wrong with it. He cleaned the controller port up, you know, he was like, that was a little bit of a connection issue there, fixed that. He designed that little part to keep the door down so that wouldn't be a problem anymore. And then he's like, after that I just recapped everything even though nothing was broken, because why not update, update that. And that was kind of it. Um, then it went back to Roger's shoebox. <laughs> so, where this ultimately kind of changed, and I don't know how many people have been following this thing at all, um, I've been taking it all over the place. To, to, I've been taking photos of it in front of ridiculous things all over the world because he turned it over. He gave me custody of it temporarily for that kind of purpose. It's had a better vacation than I had. <laughs> Everybody says that, man. Um, so, so he <laughs> I should turn it into one of those things. <laughs> you would, then you would have value. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, it's horrible. I, that's why I said it. <laughs> but anyway, so he, um, the real reason he actually loaned it to me was, uh, I, I was actually kind of done with it. I had done videos on the Pluto, I had really nothing else to say about it. But as I mentioned, the Neptune. Now, there's one in the National Video Game Museum in Frisco, Texas. And I was like, man, it'd be really cool to do a video on that. Yeah. But this might surprise you, but no museum in the world will let you walk in and just take the stuff behind the glass and do videos on it. <laughs> um, so I was like, I need to go in with some credibility. I got an idea. So I messaged Roger, I'm like, and this is gonna sound really weird, but can I fly out to California, pick up your re retirement plan, take it with me and take it down to Texas and then ask if they'll let me you know, play with other toys? 
<laughs> yeah, sure, fine. <laughs> Roger was his reaction to that was like, was anyone else no? But you know, honestly, dude, I don't even care. <laughs> I was like, you really want to fly out to California just to pick this thing up? Go nuts. So then I did. We went down to Texas. We did the whole thing. And then as soon as it was in my possession, I kept getting contacted by conventions being like, wait, you have that? And I was like, well, I don't, but it's in my custody. He was like, you want to go to the con? You want to go to the con? You want to go to the con? And it just kept happening. Um, I also separately travel all the time for my own purposes. So I just thought it would be kind of funny to take it with me and take photos of it in front of random places around the world. Um, I mean, this thing has been to the US Virgin Islands and Guam in the same week. Those are the most eastern and western extremes of the United States. I mean, Guam is three hours away from Japan. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just kind of funny to take it to all these places. Uh, but, I mean, more or less, that's its story. Now, we found out later that the uh, Japanese owner, the new Japanese owner, reached out to us and was like, hey, um, we should know each other because <laughs> there's only two of these. And, you know, there wasn't much dialogue between that, but shortly after that he messaged us again. He's like, you know what, actually, you've done all these videos, I'm going to cash in on your work. Uh, I'm going to sell mine now. And he was telling us straight up, he's like, I hope to get like two or three grand, which we actually laughed about. We didn't think that was possible. He was like, nobody's really going to care, this ain't the Nintendo PlayStation. He got $84,000. Oh. Um, so we would later talk to people at Heritage because they were like, wait, you have the other one? I was like, well, Roger has the other one, but yeah, yeah, we got the other one. They'll, you know, and this was pre-pandemic, by the way. So pandemic prices, are, hey, we're all at a retro game con. I'm sure you've noticed that caused a, a big problem. Yeah. Um, so they were like, estimate 150K. And as you can see, I'm just holding it like that. <laughs> um, so, it, no, we take good care of it, despite what it looks like. Um, uh, but yeah, no, it's, uh, that's how you know Roger's cool, because he lets you go around with his retirement plan, lets the world see it, lets, lets it lets the world play it. I mean, this thing has been sitting over in the Saturn library all day. You guys can check it out, take all the photos you want, play it, enjoy it, and do the tour. And I, that, in my own way, going back around to Terry, is kind of my way of paying homage to him, because I learned a lot from him about like what you should do in these situations. And he said one of the best things you can do, honestly, is not be like super paranoid about it. Because like whenever you see a console where it's like hidden behind glass, you'll notice that people don't really care that much. They'll look at it and be like, it's not real anymore. But if it's like accessible, playable, you know, touchable, even though you really shouldn't touch it, uh, then they care. Then they're interested. And then it's more exciting to people. And so I think, honestly, you have to give Roger a round of applause for making that possible. Because otherwise, this thing would just go back. So, yeah, it's. It's pretty cool. Um, one thing we did, we actually had several donations for this thing so that everybody can enjoy it more. Uh, we got a, a guy named Knight of Doom had donated a set of uh, retrobit wireless controllers because Roger was concerned maybe like a kid would yank the cord or whatever, so no longer a problem. People can go play it. Uh, the guys who make the Satiator donated one so that people could have multiple games on it. The Satiator actually allows us to play region, uh, different region games. Now, if you're not familiar with what the Satiator is, um, there's a little, well, actually, they took it out because they're using mine. But there's a little card that would go in the back here. It's what's called an ODE, optical disc emulator. And it basically just tricks the Saturn into thinking, hey, this is where all the games are. And it just has a ton of stuff. And so the games that I put on it are like fighting games and, you know, action games. Basically, you know, not RPGs. Because um, Terry told me, he's like, if you put an RPG on the prototype, which he learned the hard way, he's like, there will inevitably be like two guys who just sit there and never leave. Um, but he's like, you put on a fighting game, people play it for a few minutes and then they go. But um, in short, that is the Sega Pluto story. And it's still here for a little bit if anybody else wants photos or anything. Same with the dental equipment there, the hot one. So um, I, I, I think that at least that's that. Um, oh. You know what? I, I did forget one thing. Um, so we we found out a little bit later what the motive behind this was. So we had just some speculation because it clearly has the modem, it has the hard drive. This was a year before the Saturn had the Netlink, which was online capabilities. So clearly Sega, we know Sega of America wanted this to exist. And clearly they were betting on the internet as the future, which, you know, again, they were right. You know, Sega does what Nintendo. Um, so what we think happened is that they designed it around the idea of Sega Channel. Does anybody remember Sega Channel? For those who don't remember Sega Channel, it was basically Game Pass for the Genesis. Um, this 
hard drive is 512 megabytes, which is basically enough storage for any one Saturn game. So theoretically, if you were subscribed to Game, oh, game Pass, to Sega Channel, <laughs> along with this, you could have had any one game. We think that was the motive. But we got an update a little bit later. Uh, somebody was interviewing an engineer for Sega, and they had uh, one little blurb about the Pluto because it was making its rounds, and they were asking the guy, like, what was the deal? And let, I'm going to clean this up because the guy was not very nice about it, but he basically just said, like, yeah, that was a stupid idea the Americans made us do, and we had the power to reject it, so we did. It was a stupid idea. It should never have happened. It would have cost $1,000 minimum retail. There was no chance it was ever going to exist, but yeah. So basically, Sega of America wanted it to exist, but they needed Sega of Japan to design it, and they had the power to force them to do it. But Sega of Japan, while they had to build it, had the power to never allow it to be released, because that was Sega. They just kept fighting internally all the time, um, which caused them a lot of problems. But yeah, so it, it's funny actually. So if you open it up in the motherboard, there's a bunch of stickers on it that are in Japanese. And I, at, I was originally, when I had them translated originally, a friend of mine who speaks Japanese very much cleaned up the language, and then he was like, oh, it says, what on earth is this? In reality, in reality, it's, it's nothing but profanity about like how, how terrible this design is and how much they hate it and blah, blah, blah. Like it was, this was very much a, um, a hate project. <laughs> like that's, that's the only real way to put it, but it's a very cool device. I'm glad we've all got access to it. And it's ultimately, it's actually a very cool version of the Saturn. Like, to be completely real, like, if anybody's ever played a Saturn, you've turned it on and the, it always asks you what time it is and what language you want. This doesn't do that. It's been accurate for 30 years. For some reason, it's, sent to the, it's set to the central time zone of the US, which is really confusing, because that's my time zone. But I had nothing to do with it, Roger had nothing to do with it, Ben had nothing to do with it, it was just always right. Um, and we think it was because of the extra RAM that's in it. Also, bizarrely, it cannot play any of the action replay stuff. Like, the boot cards that allow for imports don't work on it. Which we thought, okay, maybe the cartridge slot is dead. But it reads memory cards, it reads the netlink. So they, they must have designed it that way on purpose. But again, why? Prototype. Don't know. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much the Sega Pluto. There you go. Now, uh, if you guys want, we can open it up to some questions about this or uh, whatever. I mean, you're, you're curious what type of coffee I'm drinking. Whatever you want. Let's just go for it. Go for it, man. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the uh, Clayco Chameleon earlier. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, what? What is that? I, I don't oh. know what that is. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> you, you want to explain that one? Do you want to come over and do that? Like, that's such a, a passion. All right. So basically, uh, from... <laughs> You just come on up. Just oh, to... oh, okay. I was adjusting myself, but I'll come up. All right, whatever. <laughs> it, uh, it, it, look, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's our to talk about it. Yeah, where's Pat? He's still here. Let him talk about He's it. He's probably please. the best one to talk yeah. about it. All right, it. well, yeah. you go ahead and give him the, the, the highlights. The TLDR. Uh, Lean in a bit. The TLDR is a gentleman, I'm using that term very loosely, Mike Kennedy, uh, wanted to create a new console but that played more retro-inspired, retro-type games and kind of leeching off of the Coleco name. So they kind of attempt... Actually, no, I'm sorry. Originally it was... Um, it had a different name in the beginning. The VGS, I think it was? Yes. Yeah. I think it, was a, it had a, a name in the beginning and it was Dumpster Fire. They somehow got the rights to Coleco. They also realized how bad of an idea that was later on. But uh, they tried to brand it the Caligo Chameleon. They tried to take it to different conventions and shows with the Atari Jaguar shell that they used. However, when they actually put guts inside, I believe it was just a capture card motherboard and some fake bits and pieces to make it look like a real console <laughs> when it was just jerry-rigged through this, through a monitor with an SNES and an EverDrive. So... This man tried to take a bunch of people, I mean, he successfully took a bunch of people's money, oh. and he just dips it on everyone and is like, hi. And then the retro gaming community unleashed its fury in its finest form. Yes. And um, he's pretty much a name that we don't speak of anymore. <laughs> he's turned into a Voldemort. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Go for it. I'm 
assuming the Pluto came out before the Dreamcast? If so, oh yeah, um, so, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear on that. It was built in January of 96. We actually have a timestamp right on one of these parts. Um, yeah, this thing was in development like three years before. It's, it's actually a common thought that it's like the half step between the two, but it's, it's really more of a Saturn Plus, not so much like, hey, this is the missing link console. Okay. Yeah. Also, uh, the fact that like Sega of Japan just hated making it, um, is that probably like the reason why like Sega of America decided to just drop support of the Saturn in America? It honestly, dude, I, I, it wouldn't surprise me. I don't know that to be true, but we do know that they really didn't get along. Um, I mean, famously, if you guys remember the history, Bernie Stoller got out on stage once and was just like, yeah, Saturn's on our future. And this was back in, like, when it was in their prime. It would have been, like, one year into the Switch if, you know, the head of Nintendo was like, eh, Switch, we're not going to make that anymore. <laughs> like, it, it's like, what? Why would you say that, dude? It, you know, so, yeah, it would not surprise me. I mean, there was, there was a book about this recently. I think it was Console Wars, where Tom Kalinske was kind of talking about, like, everything was Japan's fault. And then Japan, of course, like everything was Americans' fault. Like they just did not get along as a company back then. Go for it. So two things. One, Console Wars is a great book, but Tom Kalinsky said how he had he worked his ass off to convince Sega of Japan to get along with a bunch of stuff such as Sonic Two, Sonic Three, mm -hmm. and eventually the downfall that was the 32X and then Saturn, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Secondly. If only Sonic Extreme prototypes were found on a Sega Pluto, that would have been really cool. You know what's funny that you mentioned that? Because they're playable in the other room. Oh, yeah. I <laughs> yeah, and there's like updated versions. You were playing it earlier, Dave. He was. Um, all the way in the back there, man. Yeah, you, you, yep. Okay, perfect. I'll stand up. Um, so I just wanted to say that um, Sega's whole line of their solar system products. There is a theory that and that was a factor into why the Pluto kites did not come out. And that was because Sega realized that if they had to name products after the planets, they would at some point have to release the Sega Uranus, which they did not want to do. Do you think that might have been a factor? Considering Sega's Japanese, I don't really think they would have cared. <laughs> I, I think that they would have been, I mean, that's... I mean, the, I think they would have just, in all seriousness, I think they would have just changed prototype names, because they essentially did. The, you know, the Dreamcast was all the, the Katana series and so on and so forth. But, hey, maybe you're right. <laughs> Let's go right here. So, with the Nintendo PlayStation, it's the one that's been around the longest. Mm -hmm. Do you say the new, like, Holy Grail prototype console find would be? The Phantom. <laughs> the Infinium Labs Phantom. And does anyone know what that even is? Yeah. All right, we got a good crowd. <laughs> um, I would, I would have to. I mean, that's kind of more my joke answer, but at the same time, it might also be the real answer because the problem with those types of prototypes is you don't know about them until they exist. They're usually like a rumor. Um, personally, I would love to see the Sega Jupiter pop up. Um, there was, actually you get a kick out of this, we do know that Sega, it doesn't have a code name to my knowledge, but Sega was working on a Virtual Boy competitor. I'm not surprised. They believed in that idea. Not as much as Nintendo did, but they believed in it. Well, I'd if love I recall correctly, didn't Sega have like a three-dimensional thing way before Nintendo they, was attempted with As Virtual I said, Boy? Sega does with Nintendo. Um, they had it for the Sega Master System. There were 3D glasses okay. and stuff like that. Yep. Um, yeah, you do. I got one. Yeah. Nice. But, um, yeah, I guess I would personally like to see the Jupiter, but I think the Infinium Labs Phantom would be a really cool thing to actually see surface. Yeah. It's gotta be like the most. It's gotta be like the most, sorry. It's gotta, gotta be the most appropriate name for any prototype. Yeah, it really, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, what's with the, uh, the pink virtual boy? Oh, she, it, she started off the, the, she made that. Oh yeah, I, it's just a custom console, <laughs> yeah, like, we, not a real thing. Yeah, we, we um, talked about it at the beginning, she can tell you off camera. We only got two and a half minutes, so I promise we'll be able to. Blue shirt. Yep. Blue shirt. Right there, go for it. Is there any interesting uh, software or functionality that's unique to the Pluto? Um, functionality, yes. Uh, as far as we know, nothing was specifically written for it. Functionality wise, as I said, the clock battery on it never dies, the language never seems to die. Um, oddly, it, like I said, it can't read the action replay. Oh, the other weird thing about it, you stick the Knight's 3D controller in it, it will not turn on. <laughs> Don't know why. Um, those seem like lacks of features, I agree, but like, but again, 
it presumably could have done more with the hard drive and the modem, but this particular build of it doesn't seem to do anything with them. But since no software was specifically written to you know, address them, we don't know. However, I'm going to make an announcement since we only have 90 seconds left. Um, we have been completely unable to dump the BIOS of this thing. We've been trying for a long time. Today, the Saturn Shiro Group managed to successfully clone it. So it is possible they may learn something out of that that maybe can fix other things. We really don't know. It's, it, this just happened like an hour ago. So pretty cool. Um, I think if we have a, a lightning question, we got we can, we can do another. I'm gonna go with you. Okay, I just wondered, like, uh, do you think the BIOS, like that firmware, uh, they did that purposely to block the actual nuclear cartridge, so it's like a region preventing uh, region unlocking? It's entirely possible. I mean, that would. I mean. <laughs> The weird thing about that, and I don't have a whole lot of time, is Sega started selling versions of the Saturn with boot carts. So it, like the Samsung Saturn, the Korean one, straight up came with one because they used their own stupid region coding and then realized that was a bad idea. <laughs> so there were versions of the Saturn that actually retailed with one. So I find it unlikely they would have done it for that reason. It's also more likely that the reason it wouldn't read them is they perhaps thought that was some sort of bypass for piracy or something. I mean, ultimately, they were right. The pseudo-Saturn does exist, and that allows you to bypass all that stuff, which, incidentally, pseudo-Saturn doesn't work on this. Um, but, yeah, to be honest, speculation. Don't know. So that, unfortunately, does it for us. I want to thank Candace. I want to thank Jesse. Thank you guys very much for being here. And uh, we'll see you all later. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and to the right are the playlist of the Portland Retro 2022 and some other interesting videos. Thank you.